Welcome to Italics, television for the Italian-American experience. I'm your host, Anthony Tamburri. Michael Moore is a translator primarily from Italian to English. His published translations range from 20th century classics, Agostino by Alberto Moravia and The Drowned in the Save by Primo Levi, to contemporary novels, most recently Fabio Genovese's Live Bait and Nicola Gardini's Lost Words. Michael Moore visited with us at the Calandra Institute to discuss his most recent translation from Italian of the classic historical novel The Betrothed by Alessandro Manzoni, the first New English translation in 50 years. The Betrothed is a cornerstone of Italian literature, language, and culture. Published in its final form in 1842, The Betrothed has inspired generations of Italian readers and writers. <laughs> Michael, welcome to Italics. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. It's good to have you here. You have um, have this major accomplishment, yeah. translation of Manzoni's The Betrothed, I Promessi Sposi. But let's start out first about Manzoni. Who was he? Why is he important? And what he represents from the literary historical yeah. point of view. Yeah. Oh, uh, there's a lot I could say about <laughs> him. I'll, I'll try to be brief, but it's tough. I mean, you're looking at the man that created modern Italian, first of all, modern literary Italian and who has written still today the greatest Italian novel. And a novel that I think really is one of the greatest European novels of the 19th century. Mm -hmm. When you look at his life, I mean, it's sort of remarkable. He was born in you know, the late 18th century and lived until really shortly after the creation of the Kingdom of Italy. But it's a lifespan that includes the French Revolution, the Reign of Terror, the Rise of Napoleon, and the three Italian Wars of Independence. Although he himself was apolitical to a certain extent, he was also very much in favor of the creation of a united Italy, and he th thought that modern Italy also needed a modern language, because up until that point, most of Italy was illiterate. Most Italians were illiterate, I should say. Lately, I've been asking myself, what did they used to call Italian? You know, they called them the Volgari, and I, I still haven't done that research. Maybe one of your viewers can tell me that when did they start calling the language of Italy Italian? Italian. Because there's such a great density of dialects in Italy. He was from Milano, from a very distinguished family. Um, when you sort of look at who his mother was, you know, Giulia Beccaria, her father, his grandfather was Cesare Beccaria, the author of one of the, of, I think, the first European tract opposing capital punishment mm -hmm. and torture. And his, has its own, had its own influence on American law, American judicial law. Absolutely, thought. absolutely. Yeah. His natural father was one of the Veris who had created Il Café, this very important mm -hmm. magazine, and Pietro Veri had also written an important tract on economy, first of all, but also against torture, um, and themes that sort of come up in the novel, actually. And they were also great proponents of, of Milano and Milanese as the standard for Italian. So when you're looking at what Italian was, if we can call it that, yeah. right, um, you were looking basically at a standard for the language that was settled in the 16th century by Pietro Bembo, but based upon the writing of the 14th century yeah. of Petrarch and right. Boccaccio. And since the Italians like to talk about, you know, who's a major figure in prose, who's a major figure in poetry, and when they were arguing back in the Renaissance, they were saying, well, in Latin you had Cicero and Virgil, right? And, but we have writers that are just as good. And the argument for Florentine, which became the standard, was that they had the best writers. Right. And the best writers being, you know, for that time, Boccaccio for prose and Petrarch for poetry. It's funny, when we're looking at the highest standards of the Italian language, we're looking at certainly uh, Manzoni for prose and Dante. We can also say, you know, about I Promessi Sposi, as far as now a novel, right? It, it becomes one of the first, but it becomes the predominant Italian novel. Yeah. And it becomes the quote unquote model in many ways. Mm -hmm. You mentioned language, and yeah. tell us a little bit about how in Italian this went through a couple of edit yes, linguistic, linguistic editing. At, right? least, at least three versions yeah, exist that we I know mean, of. He started writing in 1821. He had been writing you know, poetry, he was well known as a poet, he'd written two tragedies, very rooted in history, in Italian history, but in the history of northern Italy. He was fluent in French, I mean he wrote French, yeah. he spoke Milanese, and for him writing in Italian was also writing in a foreign language yeah. to an extent. Because in the first version it's called, some call it Ferme Lucia, but then there's a second draft of that same one called I Sposi Promessi, uh, which then he restructured completely, you know, cutting some things. For example, there's a whole coda on the um, Monica di Monza. 
a novella within the novel. Uh, but he restructured it, improved it, I would say, in the restructuring, and published it in 1827. But then there was some criticism that the Italian that he used was based upon his readings of old Italian texts using words that were no longer used. Well, in 1840, basically, he published the final version, which, you know, the claim was that it had been rinsed in the waters of, 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 the, of the Arno, of the Arno <laughs> meaning that he had corrected, he had gone to Florence, but just for one month with his whole entourage. He had acquired a couple of, you know, Tuscan experts. He wanted the living language of Florence, but he also wanted words that would be recognized in other parts of Italy. So it's not that he was excluding all these other parts of Italy, but he was creating a standard, which I think, and I've argued this with Italian writers, because there are many who criticize this decision on his yeah. part to create a national language. But having a national language, look what it did for England, look what it did for France, look what it did for Spain. Yeah. I mean, I think Italy had this very tormented history of being occupied by the French, by the Spanish, by the Austro-Hungarian yeah, Empire, yeah. Yeah. you know, and having, for pure administrative purposes, it was important to have a unified language, but for literary purposes also. Yeah. I mean, otherwise you would have just within this small country, all of these regions that couldn't communicate with each other. It's interesting that he does go from 1820, the 1820s to the 1840. Yeah. There's yeah. a 20-year span, yeah. and that's a really important time because right after he does his third version, then we have the famous or the infamous 1848, the yeah. first attempt at the unification of yeah. Italy, right, yeah. which is a total failure in writers, yeah. and the, the protagonists have to leave Italy to save their, literally to yeah, save to their save heads. Their yeah. yeah, It's a 19th century novel, but it's more than 19th century in humor and spirit. Absolutely, <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I think that's often not recognized uh, by Italians who have read it yeah. um, because of the way it's taught, like it's the Bible or something, right. you know. It is a Bible of sorts. There's a lot of humor, there's a lot of irony. Yeah. He constantly enters into the story himself, saying, well, if you don't like this part, you can skip ahead to the next chapter, you know. So he has a great kind of uh, confidence, you know, with the, uh, with the reader. He presents himself every now and then to sort of reassure them that it's just a story, it's just a little teatrino, he might say. Yeah. You know, he uses many terms from opera as well, just to sort of to indicate the theatricality of everything. There's elements also of the Gothic novel, so there are many elements that I call popular. And yeah. one of the things that I've been saying as I talk about the book uh, to Italians is that I wanted to restore its popular nature in the Italian sense of Popolare, of being of the people. Right. You know? Yeah. And people are sort of startled to hear that because they yeah. never thought of it as a uh, romanzo yeah. popolare. Yeah. You know, they, since they read it at a young age and maybe in not the best of circumstances, I, I'm happy that actually that the attention that my translation is getting in Italy is leading a lot of Italians to reread it as adults. Yeah. So, of course, the question is, you know, why in, do we need another translation? I mean, for a messy spoon. Well, you say that as if yeah. there's been so many, but yeah. I mean, historically, yes, but this is the first new translation in yeah. 50 years. Okay. And I always felt that the fact that people don't know it in the United States or that those who uh, know it only through the previous translation didn't like it, and I'd be very critical of the previous translation. Mm. Uh, when I look at them, I don't think that they captured the dynamism of Manzoni. I th don't think they captured his musicality. And most of all, I don't think that they captured uh, both his concision and the way he's constantly shifting tones, where he moves from the comic to the tragic, where he's using the gothic at certain moments, where he has dialogue that's very spirited. He's using many different kinds of language, many different registers of language. And I thought that translated the right way, with the dynamism, because how are you going to read you know, a 600-page yeah. novel if it doesn't have a kind of dynamic force within right. it? And, and if you don't have the, the, the sound for, you know, of that opening paragraph, for example, then people aren't going to read it. I mean, we read a novel for pleasure. Yeah. And I think that the pleasure had been kind of sucked out of it you know, in the earlier tr translations and, frankly, in the way that it's often taught in Italian schools. So one of your main goal was to, quote, unquote, unflatten it, give it some yeah. bubbles, right, yeah. Yeah. number one. And what were some of the challenges that you came across, like that, you know, had you for hours at your thing, with a sentence or um, two or a paragraph? Yeah, yeah. I mean, definitely the gride, these decrees, which are in documents from the 17th century, yeah. which were written in a very Baroque uh, sort of style. Uh, there were different types of challenges as I went on. Uh, I could talk about the things that came to me most easily. Uh, I think that the lyrical parts, the descriptions of landscape, came to me very easily. I lived in Como for a long time. I lived in Milano as well. I could hear in some of the dialogues even the way that people from, you know, the Lago di Como spoke, yeah. you know, having lived there and I was a school teacher there. So that came to me naturally. I think instead there are passages that are very long and descriptive. And particularly the uh, sermons of uh, Cardinal Borromeo is that I always say that 
was the part that I found the hardest. And I think that's also the only part in the novel where Manzoni completely loses his sense of irony about language. Because here, in terms of the story, we have two peasants, illiterate, chased out of their hometown, you know, which in a way is every Italian's dream, to just to live and to retire in the place where they were born. And they have to give that up. It's very much a story of migrants, mm -hmm. in that sense, of having to leave their home. I think one of the most poignant parts of the book, which always brings people to tears, Adieu ai monti, the farewell to the mountains. They're having to leave this place and thrust them into history. And then you sort of see them trying to make their way and they realize that they're always being tricked by language. Renzo complains about the Latinorum of the priest. Yeah. And they start listing all the reasons which are completely specious about why he can't get married to Lucia, the girl yeah. that he loves. And at the very end, though, when, he find, when they finally do marry and they have children, they make sure that the children are literate, you know. Um, but he still remains illiterate himself, yeah. you know. I think it was a fact that he does shift registers all the time. And of course, the fact that it's a long novel. And yeah. you just sometimes think you're never going to get to the top, you know. Um, mm -hmm. When you say shifting of registers, so we're talking about, quote unquote, common speech as opposed to something a little uh, bit more yeah, elegant the, yes. and things of that. Well, if you look at just the first 10 pages or so, yeah. we begin with this phony, um, you know, he claims to have found a document. Yeah. Um, and it's written in this very fancy language, you know, with all sorts of, uh, you know, metaphors in it, refer references to the universe, to the sun, uh, as a way of describing the Spanish king. And at a certain point, uh, he just stops and says, you know, I can't stand this, right? Who will, you know, put up with, who will yeah. endure, you know? the effort of, of reading this, you know. Yeah. Um, so there's that, you know, kind of parody of 17th century speech. And then there is Manzoni speaking directly, almost immediately, about, you know, just sort of expressing a sentiment that the reader might share about, well, this is unbearable, how can I stand this? And then, you know, he sort of rethinks it, and then he decides to do it, because he says it's a beautiful story, plain and simple. Mm -hmm. And then he begins the novel proper, you know, chapter one, with this beautiful lyrical description of Lake Como. Oh, like, right, you know, right. You know, Famous. Quel, ra yeah. quel ramo del lago di Como yeah. che volge a mezzogiorno, etc. Quel ramo del lago di Como che volge a mezzogiorno tra due catene non interrotte di monti, tutto a seni e a golfi, a seconda dello sporgere e del rientrare di quelli, viene quasi a un tratto a ristringersi e a prender corso e figura di fiume. And then suddenly we enter into action. You know, suddenly along comes Don Abontio, right? You know, sort of on his way, reading his prayer book, right? And he runs into these two bravi. And yes. that's a wonderful word for yes. them, right? Bravi. bravi because they're yes. anything but bravi. Exactly. But anything more, <laughs> it's in the Spanish sense, you know, because yeah. also, he's, you know, this is a time when the Milano is under Spanish right. occupation, you know? Uh -huh. And so the Italian is sometimes littered with Spanish, not on Zoni's part, really, but when he's yeah. quoting and stuff. And then suddenly you have dialogue happening. And dialogue is a very big part of the novel. He uses plenty of it. That was a challenge because, you know, I mean, some critics have said, oh, Manzoni has everyone speaking Florentine. That's not quite accurate. Each character has his own register. You know, there are like Agnese and Perpetua, Perpetua being, you know, the maid of the priest, which has suddenly became a generic name for all priest maids, yeah. right? There's Agnese, who is, you know, uh, Lucia's mother, Bortolo, you know, uh, Renzo's cousin, they all speak a very different kind of Italian, so I would try to imagine a different person. For the um, Agnese and Perpetua, I sort of imagine the way my aunts used to speak, because I always wanted the dialogue to sound natural. Yeah. I, I didn't want it to sound like it was just a real tense attempt to capture every twist of the Italian. I want the Italian tone there, obviously, the content and the style, but it still has to sound natural in what I call American English, right? The editing can sometimes be a problem. Your editors might want things to be more American, perhaps. And I had queries which were somewhat odd to me, yeah. you know, because I, I really did insist on keeping a certain Italian flavor to things. Since this takes place in, in the distant past and with customs that are so different from the present, I mean, imagine marriage. The only description that Manzoni gives of the engagement period between these two lovers whose story is going to occupy a full novel is that Renzo frequentava. Lucia, which, you know, they didn't date, right? Yeah. Uh, oh, no, no, I'm sorry, I was wrong. Discoreva, he spoke with Lucia, which is enough, I guess, to yeah. constitute a description right. of, of, of engagement. Yeah. Because, of course, 
up until fairly recently in you know small Italian villages and stuff, a woman could not go out, a girl I should say, could not go out on her own. Right. Had to be accompanied by a family right. member. Once she was engaged, she had to be accompanied by a brother right. of her fiance. Yes. You know, and so you know, trying to get that, you do have to get it across somehow. Discoreva, uh, that was that was tough. Yeah, and we didn't say the book is published by Modern Library. Yes. So it's not too shabby. No, no, you know, <laughs> it's a great place to be as an yeah. author, but also as a translator. It's yes. got just a history of translating great books from. Uh, from other languages. Yes, yes. For me, I think when the book arrived, first of yeah. all, when the yeah. printed cut, first of all, I said, oh my God, I'm holding my life in my hands because I put a lot of, you know, how good, long? Almost 20 years, you know, from, wow. you know, from, you know, cradle to grave, you could say yeah. from the moment I started was in 2004, actually. And then, you know, I had a full time job. Um, yeah. I had other projects that I had to yeah. finish. The final revisions were done in 2020, I guess, you know, and then there's a whole, you know, Proofreading, right. ed copy editing. I mean, uh, there was a long process. Yeah. So there was that. But then when I opened it and I saw, you know, this, which yeah. is, you know, this is the signature of the modern, of library, the modern library. I was very moved because, you know, when I was reading the great classics in high school and stuff, they were from the modern That's library. Exactly. So I think it was my goal really to have this book on the shelf next to the other classics of European literature. Yeah. You know and not in a separate sort of Italian category. Because right. I think it's a novel that has struggled to be appreciated outside of Italy. And it's on these lists of great books and stuff, but, but do people actually read it? My goal was to get people to read it and to appreciate it for what it was. And that brings us to really the notion of translation, right? And translating translation. I think for many years, translating yeah. has been seen just as sort of quote unquote work. Yeah. Nothing wrong with work, right? right. Work but for like, hire. Work even. for hire, yeah. exactly, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. The idea that there is something more uh, involved than just going from uh, libro to book, right? Mm -hmm. Or bicchiere yeah. to glass, et cetera, that there's something more important there. And that there is a creative element. Yeah. Basically what you were talking about is a type of secondary level of creativity as you, as you translate, right? You've translated others and who are? The list is long. Yeah. And sometimes, you know, I just draw a blank when I try to think of it. Most recently I did Primo Levi, The Drowned and the Saved, the Soberci Salvati, uh, Agostino by Moravia, I've done contemporary writers, Sandra Veronese, Quiet Chaos, Chaos yeah. Calmo, Fabio Genovese, a fabulous book that you know um, really helped me a lot, uh, Esque Vive, Live Bait, because it was full of humor. And it was the first time that I had translated a book that was comical, yeah. and it was very liberating, because if it's a comical book, you have to get the punchline. You can't just be very literal. And so I think just doing that book really freed me as a translator to be something other than sort of word for word, what I call the kind of pantograph approach to translation. Mm -hmm. So plenty of contemporary writers with whom I was able to resolve doubts that I had to write. I often asked them to make me a map because I sort of like to visualize what's going on. Yeah. And of course I didn't have Manzoni around to, to pester right, with questions. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I found a good commentary from Feltrinelli because many of the commentaries were just, oh, I mean they were sort of explaining the obvious. Well, I remember years ago um, at another institution I was teaching, I was teaching actually writing across the curriculum and we could do whatever we want as far as subject matter. So I chose half a dozen books, in it, Italian books that yeah. were translated, one being mm, Barzini's The Italians and then okay. I chose some creative works and I chose Christ Stopped at Eboli. Oh, yeah. And I was floored when I got to the section where Papone, who is the American, who the Italian immigrant yeah. who comes back to Italy, and at a certain point, the narrator says that Papone's stories were so boring, they were even more boring than those by Firenzuola, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, the English says they were more boring than those by Boccaccio. <laughs> and I could never figure but, out huh. where that came well, from. Well, I can see where the yeah. translator would be looking for something that Americans would recognize, yeah. but Boccaccio is not associated with boring stories. Exactly. You know, yeah. I mean, yeah, because there is that bridge that you have to build, right. you know. Precisely. Um, and uh, and the translator has to be a good writer in the language that they're yeah. translating into. It's yeah. not enough to be, you know, fluent in Italian. You need to know how to write. Yeah. And, and it is a problem, I would say, in language departments sometimes, where a student will get a really great training in Italian, but are they getting the necessary training in English, in English. and yeah. in the way to write colorfully or, yeah. or you know creatively in English? I mean, that's a big issue. You know, some of the adaptations that I had to do, which is, you know, a complete departure from the Italian, Azzecca Garbugli, you know, the lawyer figure, 
with his very funny name, which is clearly a nickname, because adzecare means to nail something, right? Hit it on the head. And ingarbugliare is to, you know, tangle something up. And it's just a way of making fun of this lawyer. And I was just like, well, I can't say adzeca garbuglia because it will mean absolutely nothing. And I puzzled over it. I saw what the previous translations had done. And then in the newspaper, I came across um, uh, reporting on a sentence, or on a dissent, I should say, by Antonin Scalia, the late Supreme yeah. Court Justice, whose father was a translator, right? And a, a professor, professor of, of at Italian. At Brooklyn College. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, you know, Scalia was, the justice was famous for his very dismissive and acidic, really, uh, rejections of the arguments yeah. of his colleagues. Yeah. And he called one argument argle bargle. He said, that's just a bunch of argle bargle to say that it was nonsense, <laughs> you know? And I was like, well, it begins with an A, it's sort of two parts, and it means yeah. nonsense, so I'll go with that, you know? Yeah. So, you know, you do have to find solutions that are, you know, with nicknames, it was tricky, you know? Yeah. I used Scarface, you know, because at one point, which, uh -huh. you know, it is tricky because then people might start thinking of, you know, yeah. Al Pacino or, you know, some right. of the old movies, right. you know, right. about Capone. But, yeah. um, you know, it was important to get across the fact that these were nicknamed and that there was a humorous intent yeah. in naming people that. So proper names are tough. That way. Yeah, yeah, nicknames too. You know, I think of w within Italian American studies, of course, linguistically there's Pietro di Donato's Christ in Concrete, yeah. which some people saw as bad English, where when you look at it, he was really sort of trying to mimic Italian in English. Yeah. And, you know. And, yeah, when I would use yeah. colloquialism, sometimes yeah. my editors would give me a hard time. I said, no, this character it's, speaks colloquially. Right. And they all spoke differently, you know, but yeah. especially Bortolo, he was really tricky. This is something new, I think, in publishing the translator being on the cover. Yeah. I insist on it. I mean, yeah. I was the chair of the uh, translation committee of Penn. Uh, the Pan American Center yep. for a few years, and um, you know we put out a model contract for translators, and you know certain terms for us are absolute. You know your name on the cover. There has been a renewed campaign yeah. now. You know thanks to Jennifer Croft and some others. Mm -hmm. um, also with the existence now of prizes, uh, you know for translation, you know the Booker International Prize, mm -hmm. uh, the Dublin uh, Award, uh, where. I think, I believe it's the uh, Booker where, the Booker International, where the prize money is split between the translator. And, and, the, not, and, and the right, oh, yes. wow, and very so, good. Yeah. But it was funny though, that the books that have come out are from Fitzcarraldo edition. So when Annie Arnaud, Arnaud you know, the French uh, novelist, won the Nobel, uh, it was, people talked all about Fitzcarraldo editions because they had done all these wonderful books. They never put the name of the, the translator, translator on the cover. Yeah. Uh, the current translator on the cover is one issue, copyright in the translator's name, because you will still get offers to uh, translate a book and they will consider it work for hire. Right. I mean, work for hire is mowing someone's lawn. Yeah. It is not yeah. doing the work of creating. Right. And a very right. prominent publisher, actually, of translations from Italian, yeah. will never give the copyright to the translator. Yeah. Which, you know, really degrades the work that a translator is doing. It's a real insult. Yeah. It's tough to talk about, you know, uh, about fees, you know, how much should be charged because then the U.S. government says it's price fixing. Right. I mean, but there's, I think, very important work done by the Translation Committee. Um, it's something that I know that I fought for. Mm -hmm. uh, and also from prominent older translators, they gave me some advice along the way, you know, about things to ask for, how big your name should be, even that stuff. This is like, you know, how many years of my life? Right, is my name exactly. not going to be on the cover? Is yeah. my name not going to, you know? I yeah. Mean, these, are, these are important yeah. things for name recognition, but just for yeah. acknowledgement, you know, a photograph is done in a newspaper. The photographer's name is always, always. next to the photograph. And copyrighted. Right? Yeah. Right? So, so, what's on your desk? <laughs> uh, right now, I'm working on the short stories, the Racconti Romani of uh, Alberto Moravia. I mean, after doing this long novel, yeah. I just wanted to have some fun with, some, with shorter pieces that I could do a story a day, kind of, and they're also very colloquial. Um, mm -hmm. There's challenges there in trying to capture some typically Roman um, yeah. uh, expressions, right. but having worked with uh, Romans for many years, when I was at the Italian mission, I've got a, some ear for it, but can I find the colorful things in English? Yeah. I'll try. And this is not your first round with Moravia, because you said before no. you translated Agostino. Agostino, yes. Yeah. It was a big success. The biggest success yeah. I've had, really. You know, it's a nice size, 100 pages. Very touching story, very, yeah. um, how could you say? I mean, it's very sensual, too. Yeah. too and it's very yeah. much about, it's, you know, it's a wonderful adolescent. Of, yeah, great coming-of-age yeah. story. Yep. And that was a huge success. Publishers Weekly named it the Book of Summer, which, you know, great. certainly had it flying off the shelves. You know? yeah. 
And this has also had its success absolutely in its early uh, life, right? Yes, I'm very happy. I mean, there's been great reviews of it, first in the Wall Street Journal, then the New York Review of Books. For me, that's interesting. Yes. And then a huge uh, story about it in the New Yorker. Right. And I've been traveling around the country, you know, going to universities, going to bookstores, you know, different mm -hmm. venues. Uh, all the time the book sells out, and actually the first run is already sold out, and the second print run is coming out now. Good. It's still only in hardback. It's right. in hardback, and it's also an e-book. There's e -book? a Kindle, uh -huh. and there's an audio book as well. Wonderful. And Who I did the audio? Ari Fidiakos is his name. Okay. Um, they had me choose from different uh, yeah. voice actors. Boy, and this is a long I liked him. to narrate. Yes, but I, I <laughs> picked him because he had an American voice. Good. You know, I think sometimes yeah. there's a tendency to use what's called a mid-Atlantic voice, um, to maybe to make something more pleasing, or somehow as if this notion of something being in British or kind of yeah. fake British is going to elevate something. I am a firm opponent of that attitude. Yeah. I think American English has its eloquence, and I wanted to stick with that. And so some of the other you know, voice actors were putting on a kind of mid-Atlantic accent. Yeah. Um, I said, absolutely not. Um, unfortunately, the ones that knew Italian, they started speaking pidgin Italian when it came to the dialogue. I said, no, it's not that I have a specific voice in my ear, but the, but the American tone yeah. of that actor is what convinced me. Thank you for taking time out. A pleasure. Um, to join us. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks for watching this episode of Italics. I'm Anthony Tamburri. Arrivederci alla prossima puntata.